time immemorial, people have been trying to survive, and it has not been easy. Here in the modern world, it's overall pretty easy, all things considered. But for nearly all of human history, it has not been that way. Trying to find food, and then trying to preserve that food for enough time so it stays fresh enough so they can actually eat it and not die from a weird disease. In my fridge right now, I have pork that's been sitting in there for days. Eventually, it's going to get turned into barbecue pulled pork. However, I've been lazy and it's been sitting there and it's been perfectly fine. It's still completely fresh. That pig was probably killed weeks ago and who knows how many thousands of miles away. How did we go from meat being only good and fresh for a couple hours to being fresh for weeks? Some of the earliest forms of preserving food, especially meat, is going to be fermentation, drying, like beef jerky, or through excessive salt use. Bacteria, fungus, other things from growing on the meat and keeping it good for longer. Similar processes have been used for fruits and vegetables, as well as being able to put them down in the deep dark places like a root cellar. But as time went on, some people figured out better ways to do it. In many places during the winter time, they would just put all their food outside so that it would stay fresher longer. Some people would put milk or other foods into containers and put it into cold streams, thus keeping it colder and fresher longer. And somebody had the bright idea that what if we had a root cellar, but we filled it full of ice and snow that we got during the winter time, could we keep meat longer? Or just be able to have a delightful treat in the summertime, ice cream styles. And that is how the ice house was born, in 1700 BC in Syria. Basically until our current time, that's how they've had ice as well as preserved meats for many millennia. Now in ancient Persia, they figured out another way to do it. Using evaporative cooling, basically a giant old timey swamp cooler, they were able to have airflow flow through an ice house, getting it even colder and being able to preserve ice and food for even longer periods of time. Many different ancient cultures also used thin layers of water over pools or in small bowls and then freeze overnight to give them tiny little bits of ice. However, all these techniques were for only the ultra super rich, the emperors, your pharaohs, your kings. Nobody normal ever got to have ice this way. Be cool, subscribe. For normal people, this didn't change until a really cool guy with cool mutton chops decided to start selling ice from New England all the way down to the south. He figured out if rich people down in the south wanted to have some ice during the summertime, he'd be able to supply it to them. This guy's name was Frederick Tudor, and soon his business took off. He started selling ice all over the world, as far away as India. Because if you fill a whole ship completely full of ice, that ice blocks keep each other colder longer. Similar to a glacier still stays frozen even though it's 70 degrees outside ice market just completely exploded. Pretty soon they started using ice for everything. This was one of the ways that meat was changed forever. Before, in the United States, they had to get cows all the way from out west to New York before slaughtering them. And individual points all had to have their own slaughter yards. But instead, because being able to pack ice with the meat onto train cars, they brought all the cows to Chicago, creating the massive slaughterhouse region of Chicago, and thus being able to produce beef cheaper and more efficiently and fresher longer than any time before. Two normal people had ice boxes in their house where they just buy a big block of ice, put it in there and be able to keep all their food fresh for a long time. What we normally consider as a cooler today, that was their main way of keeping food fresh. After a while, a bunch of different scientists created a bunch of different innovations that led to them being able to create artificial ice. These were giant ice makers, the size of an entire warehouse that were able to produce ice and it was clean, Unlike lake ice, which was just big blocks full of sticks and twigs and probably a dead fish or two that they would sell normally. This ice was pure. You could put it in the ice cream without any problems at all. And it was able to be set up anywhere. Anywhere you could put a warehouse with electricity, as well as getting the proper gases out there, you could make an ice factory. Mid to late 1800s, refrigeration really started taking off. While all of these were still commercial options, they were still able to make refrigeration cars that they were able to put food into, including meat, but also fruits and vegetables. If you've ever heard the stories about how grandma only got oranges once a year, on Christmas, that's because before refrigeration, there wasn't good options to transport fruit from a super long distance away. But as it got cheaper, instead of just expensive things like meat, they could also do cheaper things like fruit. Because of food spoilage, insufficiencies, and the lack of industrial mass production, in the year 1900, the average American family spent 43% of their income on food. Let that sink in. 
43% of their income. As time went on, these refrigerators began to be smaller and smaller. Soon, extremely rich people were able to have refrigerators in their homes, but these refrigerators cost twice as much as a Ford Model T of the time period. These were not cheap things. Besides all that, the chemicals that they were using within the refrigerators to keep them cold was ammonia and other dangerous chemicals. It wasn't until Freon was invented, they were able to have refrigerators somewhat safely in homes. Soon, domestic refrigerators became really popular. As they became more popular and more mass produced, they got cheaper. And just like everything else from microwaves to cell phones, rich people buy them, they slowly get cheaper as mass production and market efficiencies work their magic that normal people are actually able to afford them. Soon the Grim Raper of innovation, also known as creative destruction, came for the ice market. All those ice traders who would chop up blocks went away as fridges became more standardized in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Today, even the poorest people in America have a refrigerator, with small refrigerators costing well under $100. A far cry from two Model Ts, that's two cars. As innovation increased within refrigerators, average American in 1950 spent 30% of their income on food. Decrease was directly proportional to refrigeration as well as mass production and industrial growth within the food sector. Fertilizer got cheaper, transportation got cheaper, so many things because of innovation from the market. Today, despite all the inflation that we've been having pains with the past couple of years, average American still spends less than 10% of their salary on food. And when we go to the grocery store, we have more options today than any king or emperor could ever imagine 200 years or more ago. The richest kings of Europe never had the amount of food choices that we have today at our normal boring grocery store. And almost all of that, we can thank refrigeration because we could get all kinds of crazy meals from all over the world here to our local cities. Thanks refrigeration. Be like the Kool-Aid man and smash that subscribe button.